Who are so wise in the ways of science? All right, it is almost Friday and we have our exam coming up and I want you guys to do really well on this and be confident going into it. So I've uh, mustered up a little bit more reserve power here and I'm going to crank out another answer key for you on, on the video format here. And I, I'm happy it's helping some of you and many of you requested another one. And so I'm going to give it my best shot. I, I think I'm coming down with a bit of plague or I don't think it's flu, but still it's it's annoying. So if my voice goes out a little bit, I, I apologize. So I'll, I'll try to do my best on this one, but bear with me. Okay. At this point, everything on this handout, these few problems, just, you know, it should be review. If there's anything new here, uh, you need to get on it and go back to your reading, go back to your notes, go back to uh, the QSC, or, or go back to, in, to my office and get some help because, um, you know, this, this should not be new at this point. We, we've seen these types of problems over and over again. So let's dive in, do one more review, and hopefully you'll build some confidence so you can master the exam and, and be proud of yourself and, and do as well as you can. Okay. So, um, if you look at this first one, right away your spidey sense should say, you know, this is a PV problem, here it comes, I, I can knock this out. And so, the first thing says here, um, let's let's construct an indicator diagram. So let's just jump up here and, and, and give it a shot. So we, we read here and we say we got a locked piston, 5 liters initial, let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, we know that the y-axis is P external, right? And please make sure to put units, units are really important and then the x-axis is volume in liters and we start out at roughly, what is it, 5.00 liters and uh, it's okay good, we got a monoatomic ideal gas that's that's a nice simple system, it's at room temp or, you know, standard temperature uh, oh 10 atm and pressure, that's, that's pretty high pressure there and then you're going to lock it and oh you're going to expand isothermally, that's really good to know and you're expanding against the atmospheric pressure in this case a convenient 1.00. Um, well that's easy, okay, so number one, um, are you expanding one of, via one of two pathways? And right now you only know of two pathways, and the first one is irreversible. That's always against a constant external pressure. The other one is reversible, and that's the one that takes infinitely small steps, and the pressures are equal the whole time, and the whole time you're at equilibrium and all that kind of stuff, right? Well the good news is, right out of the gate you got a 50-50 shot. The even better news is uh, it's, you should never miss one of these because unless it explicitly tells you, again, unless the problem tells you you're expanding reversibly, you are not expanding reversibly. So in this case, I do not see the term reversible used anywhere in this description. So you are not expanding reversibly, which means you are expanding against a constant atmospheric pressure of 1 atm. So boom, 1.0 uh, atm, right? Okay, so you start out at 5 liters and oh, where are you going? Well, you don't know. Okay, uh oh. Pressure's not given, I mean, the volume, final volume is not given to you, but that should be easy at this point because you took Chemistry 111 and you remember everything from Chemistry 111. So PV, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. And since pressure and volume are inversely related, right, we can say that if you decrease the pressure by a factor of 10, you will increase the volume by a factor of 10, giving you a final volume of about 50 liters. That's a lot of space, right? Okay, so that means we're going to expand against constant pressure of 1 atm until we reach 50 liters, which means then we'll equal atmospheric pressure inside the piston and we'll be done with that expansion. Okay, uh, a couple other things to remember uh, that are really important is the area under this curve is equal to what? Well, it's equal to the work done by the system. And that's really important to remember. So boom, that's an indicator, indicator diagram. It's great. I highly recommend you do one. Uh, most of the time, that's the first thing you have to do in these problems because before you start running off uh, you know, down the dark alleys of the mathematics related to thermodynamics, uh, you can get into a lot of trouble if you don't first think about what is actually going on because oftentimes the math flows directly from the indicator diagram. So if you get confused, do an indicator diagram. Plus it's worth a lot of partial credit, so do that. All right, we want to calculate the Q of the system, right? So that's really important. Well, good news is we're dealing with a monoatomic ideal gas under isothermal conditions, which are the best in my opinion because then we can say delta T is zero. And then the consequence of that is that the delta U for this system 
is equal to zero, which is wonderful. But again, that's only, only, only for a uh, monoatomic ideal gas um, under isothermal conditions, right? And we'll talk more why that, about why that is in a minute, but it has also been covered in some of my previous videos. So um, you take this one and you say, okay, well, if that's the case, I know that that must be equal to, by the first law to the Q of the system plus the work of the system, right? Okay, and if you know that, you know that the Q of the system is equal to the magnitude of the work of the system, but opposite in sign, right? And so that's really, really important to know. Okay, well, this is trivial then, because remember, we just plotted a uh, irreversible pathway here, right? So it's maybe worth writing that out. So this is an irreversible path, right? And why do we care about the path? Because both Q and or both heat and work are very much path dependent, and we've shown you many examples of that. So in this case, what I do is I typically just say, okay, well, I know that uh, Q of the system is equal to negative of the work of the system, which means it's equal to negative of negative P external, right, times delta V. That's not so hard. Let's go ahead and just knock this out, right? So we say then that, and of course these signs cancel, right? So we can say that that's equal to P external times delta V. Okay, no problem here. We know we are uh, expanding against that constant external pressure of 1.0 atm, and our final volume we uh, determined here was 50.0 liters minus 5.0 liters. It's basically 45, right? Um, and what I do here is I look at my units. I say I got ATM here and I got liters here. I, I just don't like the unit of liters ATM. It's just not one of my uh, my favorite things in the world. So I would prefer that we go ahead and convert to uh, our good old unit of the joule, uh, which is, and this is a constant or conversion that I will give you. It's basically 101.3 joules for every liter atmosphere. And in this case then, you crank this out, and if my calculator button pushing is working this evening, I get something on the order of positive uh, 4.56 kilojoules. And, you know, if you wanted to work, you would know the work would be negative 4.56 kilojoules, and, and we're all good. So that's, that's really exciting. Pretty simple review, but, you know, some of you maybe could use a little bit more practice. Okay, next question says, is this expansion exothermic or endothermic? Well, you might be tempted to just go, oh, well, I see here that's a positive sign, so it's endothermic, and, and you would be right, but I want you to go a little bit deeper, and I want you to give me a microscopic or a microscale explanation. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I want you to go down to the atomic level or the molecular level and tell me what particles are doing. Invoke that kinetic molecular theory that we talked about in in uh, chemistry 111 hopefully and so what I typically do is I kind of zoom in and have my little um, nano camera if you want to call it that and so I'll look at my piston right I've got my piston here and uh, I got my really thin piston wall right I can oh my art is terrible I'm sorry guys and uh, my piston wall can slide up and down and we know that under expansion that wall is going to be pushed out or up until the pressure equalizes but in this case I'm going to zoom in as best I can and visualize this gas right I've got these little particles of gas and they're all moving around um, doing their thing right they got lots of translational energy and what's going to happen well I've got my little particle and it's going to collide you know with the wall here boom you're going to get a big old collision and that particle is going to impart some of its energy to uh, you know the wall of this piston and that piston is going to move a little bit because we've got lots of these we've got you know probably a couple moles or something in there and that's a lot of collisions exerting a lot of force over an area and that's pressure right and so um, if this guy were to bump here impart some of it, its energy to ever so slightly move or contribute to moving that that piston wall what's going to happen well, that particle is going to lose some energy, and if it loses some energy, it's going to slow down. And why is that? Well, you remember that for a uh, monoatomic ideal gas, right? So for a 
monoatomic uh, ideal gas, the only contribution to the internal energy of the system is from kinetic energy of the translational variety, right? The movement, the XYZ coordinate movement of those particles. And that's the only contribution, right? And so remember, um, that also plays into our definition of temperature, right? Because temperature is a measurement of that average translational kinetic energy, right? So it's really, really critical. So that means if these particles begin to slow down, both the internal energy and the temperature are going to decrease unless you do what? Unless you begin to impart some energy, and in this case, in the form of heat, to the system because that's the only way you're going to keep those particles moving at the same speed which means you will be keeping them at the same average translational kinetic energy which means you will maintain isothermal conditions which are stated in this problem so again the particles impart some energy to move the piston up and expand and as they do so they would slow down because they're losing energy but you have to impart energy in to keep that uh, that internal energy constant, that temperature constant, and there you go. So it's got to be endothermic. All right, let's keep going here. The next one says, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the entropy of the system for this expansion. Well, you know, the way I think about it is, is what, what do I have in there? Well, um, if you notice up above, I don't think we told you, and I'll, I'll zoom up top not to make you motion sick here or anything. Oh, watch out. No, uh, just kidding. Um, if you look at the top here, you notice that nowhere did I say how many moles of gas. And that's kind of a jerky thing to do. I, I apologize, but y you know me, so I uh, can't help it. So um, we have to think about how many moles are actually there. And so it might be worth a, a quick little aside here using the ideal gas law to say, okay, well, I know that N equals PV over RT. And if I crank that out, I think I actually get something like 2.04 moles of gas. And, and that's really important. Um, and so think about that. you got two moles, right? That's, that's like 10 to the 23rd of these guys running around, banging all over the place, you know, hitting the walls of the container, moving everywhere. It, it's a big mess, right? And you've got them confined to five liters at the beginning. Okay, well, let's think about the number of ways we can arrange those particles or they can be arranged in that five liter space, right? And then we, we let this expand. Now we're, we've got the same number of particles, but so man, they they got open pastures, they can run. you got 50 liters of space to run to now. And so keeping track of those same particles at 10 times the volume is much more difficult. There are a lot more microstates, a lot more different arrangements uh, of, of, of ways that you can have those particles at 50 liters. So they're going to be a lot more disordered, a lot more difficult to keep track of. Right? And so we're going to say this is definitely going to be positive change in entropy for the system. So that's, that's really important. But let's go ahead and calculate. Well, again, we know that we have isothermal conditions, right? So there you go. And we can say again that del delta U of the system, right, is going to be equal to zero which again just means that the Q of the system, as we did above, is equal to the magnitude of the work but opposite sign. And we can remember that delta S for the system is defined as the Q over T. But you gotta be really careful here because you look at this and you might remember just enough to be dangerous and, and, and you can really go off the rails here. It's not any Q. Remember, entropy is a state function, right? That's really important. So we can't just pick any Q because if you pick any Q, then, then you've just derailed entropy from being a state function. It's a very specific one. We have to remember that it's actually the Q reversible. And there are a lot of reasons for this. I can't. I could spend a whole other video on why this is, but for right now, the easiest thing to explain it as is just there has to be one path. And you know that you can have infinite number of irreversible paths, but there's only one. Repeat, only one reversible path. And that one is the one we have to use. Even if you didn't do the reversible path, you have to calculate it as if you did. And that's really important. So you can crank this guy out. You can say, oh, I, I don't know how to calculate Q. Ah, it doesn't matter, because you know that you can calculate work. So we can revert, revert it to uh, work reversible over T. And if we do that, right, we can then say that 
this one ends up being something along the lines. And again, I'm not going to derive it here. You can go back and look, but it's essentially going to be number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature over the temperature times natural log of uh, V final over V initial. The uh, nice thing about this is temperature actually cancels out and you end up getting uh, the number of moles times the gas constant times natural log of V final over V initial. Not too difficult, right? You can actually crank this out. Um, this is going to equal something like 2.04 moles. Uh, you can pick what gas version of the gas constant you use, but please, I just implore you, uh, to go ahead and use the, the one with joules in it because we are looking for energy and it makes our lives so much simpler to actually be in joules as opposed to liter atmospheres. And then um, what do we have here? We have our final volume is 50.0, right? Liters over 5.0 liters. And if you crank this out, push the right numbers in the calculator, I think I get something like positive 39.1. Again, watch your units, the moles cancel you're left with joules, not kilojoules, it's joules, right? Joules per Kelvin. And the signs match up, as they should, and that's really important. Okay, there you go. All right, almost done with this first page here. Okay, here they say once the expansion is completed, the piston's compressed back to its original state, and this is really important. It's both, both isothermal and more importantly for our purposes, it's reversible. So this is reversible. So you have to remember that. So let's go ahead and do our, our P here. Uh, in this case, P external equals P internal the whole way because we're doing this uh, reversibly. So you don't even have to worry about that. And we'll go ahead and put some nice units here. Um, again, the volume is down here in liters. Uh, remember, we started at 5.00 last time and we expanded out to 50.0 liters, right? And that's where we ended, right? We pushed against one ATM. There's our final state. We need to go back to the initial, which was 10. So, wow, that's, that's gonna be a lot of pressure, right? So we're gonna have to, let's see if I can do this with my pen. There you go. Okay, so this is the reversible path, right? And we're compressing, so we're going in that direction. And in this case, you can say, oh, wow, look at that area. That's a lot of work. Remember, that's the work of the system. So in this case, you're compressing, right? So the surroundings are doing work on the system, and your energy's, internal energy is going up, right? So this one says, OK, hold on. It says, predict the sign of Q for the system for the complete cycle. OK, I kind of break this one down. And so I say, OK, let's look at step two since it's right over here. I'm going to actually look at the work of the system instead of Q and I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. We know that this is a large area and it is positive work system, right? You can calculate it, that's great, go ahead, but I wouldn't do it because if you're on an exam and you don't have to calculate something, don't, it's just wasting time. And then we can consider step one, right? And so step one, we know that step one uh, the work of the system was negative. And so let's try to figure out which one of these wins, which one dominates. So I look at the area here. That's a pretty big area. I go back up here. I look at this. That's a pretty small area. So the negative for the expansion work is, I want to say, well over um, overcome by the positive value here. So if I added these together for the cycle, which you can do mathematically, or you can just look at it and say, you know, if, if you kind of cheat here and you look at this little rectangle here, this is effectively the area from the first step. And you see all this extra area up here for the second step. So the second step dominates, right? And that's really important. So the second step wins. That means that for the work system for the cycle, I'm going to say it's going to be positive. Which means then, if we want to solve for Q system, we can say that Q system for the cycle is equal to the negative of the work system for the cycle, right? So there you go. In this case, then, it's going to be negative. And so you can circle that one. There you go. And then finally, it says, I love these questions. Uh, predict the sign of 
uh, free energy change for the system for the complete cycle and I love this because say it with me now Delta G is a state function I need to get like some echo effects right or something like radio people have state function state function there you go I know that's corny I'm sorry I try to wake you up so if it's state function doesn't care how you get there all it cares is where you start and where you end and for a complete cycle you, you start and end at the same spot which means effectively nothing has changed and so that is a big old goose egg big old zero there you go state function okay all right moving on um, this is getting kind of long so I'm trying to hurry sorry guys okay this next one I like a lot um, because right away you see that we have a different scenario here we've got butane butane is basically lighter fluid right and if you ever hopefully you know you don't smoke please don't smoke terrible terrible stuff yeah but if you've ever gone to the grocery store you've probably seen lighters right and if you see a little lighters that are transparent they're butane lighters and if you look in there's a the little liquid and that's that's butane but butane's normally a gas it's compressed and that's why it's a liquid in that little container um, but anyway uh, you look at this and it can be stored as a liquid but if you open that or if it cracks or whatever um, it'll vaporize and because the normal boiling point is really low I mean look at that negative half a degree right so let's let's do something with this 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 um, this fuel uh, molecule and the first thing I want you to tell I want you to write down this is not not helium right this is not a monoatomic ideal gas so do not make those assumptions we made in the first part because they will be wrong just totally wrong okay so this one doesn't even ask you for a calculation but wants to know what equation would you use what formula would you use to calculate the heat of vaporization or the enthalpy of vaporization ah what is that guy that's standard so we want to know how do you calculate the standard heat of vaporization for this one well pretty cool if we look at it, we can write the equation right. So it's going to be C4H10 liquid going to C4H10 gas. By definition, one mole, right? And if we know this is at standard state, we can use standard heat of formation values, right? And you can get those from the table. And so it's really simple to write the formula then, right? It's just going to be the delta H standard standard heat of vaporization right is going to be equal to I know some of this freaks you out you guys don't like this Sigma notation but it's a summation right of the number of moles of product which in this case is trivial right it's one times the um, standard heats of formation from the table for those values and in this case the summation is kind of silly because there's only one mole of each minus the sum or the moles of reactant right each individual reactant times its heat of formation there you go right products minus reactants and if you wanted to actually write it another way you could say simply um, that's equal to um, one mole of um, gas right C4H10 times its delta H of formation minus one mole Ah, my pen's getting kind of crazy. Of, of liquid, right? Times the standard heat of formation for the liquid, and there you go. That's 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 really simple, right? And then finally, I already gave you this one because that's one of my pet peeves: is always assuming things when they're not the case. Uh, if you want to actually calculate the internal energy, um, you'd actually have to calculate it, right? Because if you wanted to find delta U of vaporization, you can still apply the first law, but you'd actually have to find the Q of the vaporization and add it to the actual work uh, of vaporization. And you can calculate those. I mean, that's not hard. We did something similar to that in class. And so um, this, is, this is not, right? It is not equal, and I'm going to write this in big letters, delta U of vaporization is not zero, right? Because it is not um, a mono a monoatomic ideal gas, right? And that is really, really, really I mean, underline it, italicize exclamation part point, 
I had some sound effects, I'd put it in there. Um, but there you go. Really important. All right, we're almost done here. Last little bit, and you know that I love these questions, and you'll see them on the exam, these, these sign questions. And so here we got work vaporization. Well, this is easy. You're doing, uh, basically, you're going from no gas, or the absence of gas, negligible gas at your first approximation, So, um, and you're going to one mole of gas. So that is definitely what we would call expansion, right? Oh, goodness, I forget about the table writing. Um, so expansion work, that's PV work which means that the system is doing the work so work system is negative right and then that's right here try to grab my course it moves sorry guys negative okay Q vaporization well you're, you're vaporizing something right you're going from a liquid you're going from a liquid to a gas well guess what you have to add energy to do that right it's an endothermic process and so that's going to be a positive Q, right? That's really important. Delta S of vaporization, again, you're going from a liquid to a gas. Gases are much more disordered. In fact, remember, gases are by far um, most disordered, right? The most disordered. So in that case, you're definitely going to positive, right? Delta S is positive. This one's kind of fun. You say, okay, at 50 degrees, remember, this is 50 degrees, and we said the boiling point was, what is it, negative half a degree if I scroll up and you can look at your paper. If that's the case, we are above, right, above the boiling point. So if we're above the boiling point, that's pretty spontaneous, right? So spontaneous, which means for a spontaneous process, delta G is negative. That's really important. And then finally, remember that if something is spontaneous by the second law, the um, entropy of the universe is, or entropy of an isolated system, universe, whatever we're going to call it, um, is, is positive, right? Always increasing. And so we could measure the entropy change for the system and the surroundings and do all that mess, or we can relate it back to delta G, which is so nice, right? We already said it's spontaneous, so that means it's uh, positive delta S for the universe, right? And if you, if you really wanted to, to remember this, it's not that important. But um, you can always relate negative T uh, delta S of the universe to delta G. And so what that means then is that the signs for a spontaneous process, delta G is negative when it's spontaneous. But remember that delta S of the universe is positive, both by the second law and by this um, arrangement as well. So I just put second law. So again, as we talked about in class, you can have a bunch of different answers. I always kind of go for the throat on these and knock them out as quickly as possible, put the simplest explanation, but you got to have some detail in there. So make sure you get your full credit because boy, oh boy, for these little sign questions, you should knock them out quickly. It should be points in the bank. It should make you feel good. And the last thing I'll tell you uh, before I let you go is on these exams, I know you can get stressed and the way I just one technique I use is when I get that exam there's no need at all to go in order just start flipping through if you see things that you're confident you can do do those first build that confidence and then track tackle the ones that are a little bit tougher for you and then do the best you can and the last little bit of you know tip I'll give you is make sure that you don't leave anything blank because I just promise you that's the only time I take all the points off you know, you get no credit if you don't give any 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 effort. So at least try to put down indicator diagrams, put down some formulas. If you have no clue, just do your best to try to get a little bit of, of partial credit. Just never, never, never leave it blank. Okay, this is the last answer key uh, video that I'm going to do before the exam. I, I, I'm glad they've been helpful for many of you, and um, I'm happy to do them. And as we move into the next unit, I'll do more. So um, study hard, uh, get help, go see the QSC. Um, keep working hard and it'll pay off. All right. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Thanks again. See you in class.